Hello, everybody. Um, today, I am very, very lucky and, and grateful and delighted to have my good friend, Afro Raymond, once more here to discuss the Corruption Perception Index with me. We've done webinars on this topic in the past, and of course, Afra is a huge advocate for transparency in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and I'm very delighted to have him once more to discuss this very important issue in Trinidad and Tobago. But I will let Afra introduce himself better, and then we'll get into the discussion. Yes. Good morning and welcome, well, Afra. Good morning, Mala. Good morning, viewers. It's actually Sunday morning, the um, 26th of January of 2020. So I'm sitting here speaking with Mala Dukaran on this regionally based webinar on the question of Trinidad and Tobago's score in the Corruption Perceptions Index. And as I was explaining to Mala during our warm up, I am not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm getting less and less faith in the whole efficacy and meaning of the Corruption Perceptions Index. And I don't get that loss of faith. I mean, I'm talking on a Sunday and I'm quipping because Sunday is not really my day, but I don't get that loss of faith purely by focusing on Trinidad and Tobago because as Mala pointed out, there's an important degree of corroboration and intersectionality with other measures about mismanagement and improper handling of public resources and so on. So the Corruption Perceptions Index scores, which have been roughly in line 30, 39, 40, 41 for the last 10 years, there hasn't been much of a variation there. Those scores corroborate the other measures that Mala was referencing, the economic measures. Well, My just one seems, second, one, one second, so, Afra. Mala, you so you're ahead. referencing a conversation that the viewers would not have been yes. privy to because we had it before we started sure, recording. Sure. So let, let me just say that, yeah, you go ahead, yeah. tell us what, what your, I guess, um, reservations are with respect sure. to the Corruptions Perceptions sure. Index. But the My, point, just for the sake of views, the yes. point I was making is that, you know, once you start a measure, you start to make mistakes. And of course, there are shortcomings with every single index and every single measure yeah. that we can think of. But what I find, um, I suppose, uh, that gives validity to what we're seeing and the Corruption Perception Index, which, by the way, Trinidad declined yet again, yes. is that you're seeing consistent declines in across almost every measure and every index you could think of for Trinidad and Tobago on the doing business indicators, competitiveness indicators, uh, corruption perception index, democracy index, happiness index, um, and even on the macro variables. And, and, the, and the errors and omissions item of the balance of payments is, in my view, a reflection of the level of corruption. And then, of course, the level of crime in total is also um, deteriorating. And so for me, even though there are weaknesses, and I understand your hesitation or reservations with respect to the corruption perception index, for me, directionally, it is consistent with the other indices. And that's the point Absolutely. that we were making. So yeah, sorry, you go ahead. Absolutely. My reservations come at an international level. OK. You see, if you go to the transparency main report, the International Transparency Report coming out of Berlin, mm -hmm. they have made an interesting shift in their analysis. And I, I, I want to tell myself that shift was in relation to some of the sound, solid criticisms coming about the whole efficacy of the CPI. Okay. They made a shift in their analysis that actually points out that some of the resource-rich, quotation marks, third world or global south countries that have mm -hmm. scored very low down in the ranking of corruption perception over the years, Mm -hmm. Those transactions, those arrangements, mm -hmm. that set up, you talk about economic hitmen, those things are facilitated and arranged out of some of the first world countries that yeah. supposedly score very high on the same yeah. corruption perception index. So coming out of Berlin this year, it's very interesting. So I say if you yeah. look at Trinidad and Tobago, one cannot achieve a degree of unity to use the mathematical term. But if you look at glo the global findings of TI and the global learning, that is where, that is where the, the, if, if you're talking about the disease, the cancer, that is where the cancer is rooted. So yes, right. we have a leadership that should do better 
And yes, we have a citizenship that needs to be alert. But those of us who study these things and understand these things in the city of London and is Wilmington, Delaware, and this is where this is where the problem is rooted. But in fact, if you go to America's corruption perception index or the UK's corruption perception index, when you talk to the business and commercial and professional leaders in those countries, they don't think they're corrupt. No, it's you're right. Normalized. Ox Oxfam the language also... of theology has been normalized. Right, you're right. And Oxfam also. So that's made what I'm, that's the level I'm coming at. I'm not contradicting you. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to bring yeah. up a slightly different shift in the, in the discussion. No, you're right. And yeah. Oxfam made a similar um, mm -hmm. conclusion in their yes. recent report as well that it's one thing to criticize, you know, these small countries that they always criticize in this region for being tax mm -hmm. havens. But the real tax havens and the real large money laundering, the, the countries that most of the money laundering takes place is in, is in London and, and, and the US yes. and the Netherlands and these countries that are busy blacklisting everybody else. So well, let, me, let me stick, let me stick, let me stick three things, three points back at you with a swift rejoinder. The first point, and I like to give readers references. The first reference, if you're interested in this issue, that one of the issues is um, uh, there's a there's a, a NGO globally called Global Witness. Mm -hmm. There's another one called the Tax Justice Network. And the mm -hmm. third one, I would tell people if you want to read a single book that tells this story, I'm trying to sketch quickly in this webinar. Nicholas Shaxon, S H A X S O N, has written a book called Treasure Islands which deals in depth, I mean, shocking examples about transfer pricing and taxation and, and economic thievery that takes place at a global level and where it's rooted and how it's, how it's conducted. And, and mm -hmm. the last point I would say to you, Mala, because we're dealing with reality and reality is rooted in our perceptions. I never use the phrase blacklisted. I would say embargoed or I would say whitewashed. Blacklisted almost verges for me on a type of an unhappy racism. <laughs> And I, oh, I, I, know, I know it just slipped out, but <laughs> we're not blacklisting, we whitewashing. So let's keep True. going. Like white water. Let's keep going. That, that, that blacklist is unfortunately just that. But yes, um, yes. because none of the predominantly white countries are on the blacklist, by the way. Absolutely. Um, but let's, 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 let's go back to the, the, yes. the CPI. Mm -hmm. Tell us, I, yes, Trinidad had declined uh, in the last index that came out yes. last week. Yes. And uh -huh. um, Yes, you have your your reservations around the index and the efficacy of it. But tell us over time, let's say over 10 years, how have we fared on this index? And and what are your thoughts on, on how we have fared? As I, as I said, we have mm -hmm. fluctuated in a very narrow range. So I think the right. range is over 35 to 41 is the actual in score. In terms of the score. Like score, yeah. Right. And in but terms, in of, terms the ranking, of the ranking, yeah. it's mm -hmm. about the same thing, about midway, okay. a little below midway. Some years it was okay. 39, and with the same figure as China, it's it's really such a small fluctuation okay. that it, it, there really isn't much to discuss, to be quite frank. So and in fact, within been... the period, you're asking about 10-year period, Mala. Within the period, I think in the sixth sixth year long, there was a shift in that some some places that they used to measure, they stopped measuring those, and they brought some fresh ones in. And the politicians in the office at the time, which I believe was the previous administration, used that shift. In, in, in the primary data sources to say, well, in fact, it's not the same thing. But As I don't know if I agree with all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I agree with all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. universal of all politicians. Sure, so, sure. So, so, that, so, that so, so in essence, we haven't really deteriorated or improved materially. No, no. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of gradual, slight decline. Okay, That's gradual, slight decline. Summary, yeah. So the important thing, the important takeaway is that we really have not made progress. Okay. No, no, we have good, great. Let's move on to the issue of procurement, which you have sure. made lots of noise about, and you've yeah. written some brilliant articles, and you've exposed a lot of what has been happening. Uh, yeah. And congratulations, and thank you for that that work that you yeah. do. That really, I mean, uh, nobody else is really doing what you do to bring these issues to light. Tell us what is really the most troubling aspect of this. And what you think the, um, the 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 end game is basically? Right. Let me just walk through this mm -hmm. for, for listeners, for viewers. Mm -hmm. What is happening is that we, and when I say we, I mean civil society and professional groups. We created a system. We wrote a law 
we did the research, we took the leadership and submitted to government, successive governments, the Patrick Manning administration, the Mrs. Kamla Prasad Bissessa administration, draft laws to put trans transactions in public money and disposals of public property under independent and modern and effective control. That's what this is. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand the highlights in the story. The highlights in the story are mm -hmm. the yes. law that we created is world class. The law that okay. we created was created by people looking like me and you. Mm -hmm. The law that we created was for the betterment of our country for, for the next 50 years. And in fact, the, the decisive point to take away is that the entire change was self-propelled. Okay. That's great. The American ambassador didn't insist on this. The Chinese ambassador didn't ask for that. The UK ambassador didn't ask for the other. We in Trinidad and Tobago, as conscientious citizens, took steps. And I was, I was, I am honored to have been part of that group for a number of years, as, as, as you would know and so on. Okay? We did serious work to get us to this point. And the important point is that it's self-propelled. So it's a question of indigenous recognition of a problem. Doing the international research and the sleepless nights and paying an attorney of the level of skill to draft the whole law. Because we submitted a draft law to Mrs. Kamla Prasad Bissessa's government in the third week of December of 2010. We drafted the law. And the law that is there now, the one we are talking about, and we'll get to that, the law that is there now is about 95% of what we drafted. Okay. We drafted the law. Okay, great. We submitted all of them, Chief State Solicitor and Solicitor General and the AG at the time, and all of them you submitted us. But to explain it to them what it is we're trying to do. Dr. Tiwari, all of them. Okay, Mr. Imbert, Dr. Rowley, and all of these people, and so on. Okay? We are the ones who wrote that law. So the point being, the change is not only necessary, It is possible. So we need to confront Indeed. because we are having a discussion that is that is at once practical and philosophical. We need to consult, we need to confront, I'm sorry, Mala, we need to, we need to confront. The word consult just jumped out from nowhere. It must have been frightening for some of these politicians listening to that consult. Imagine that. We need to confront. We need to confront what is in our own hearts. And many of the people I deal with, and we need to talk about that. Eh? As we say in Trinidad and Tobago, in our hearts of hearts, many of the people I deal with are not necessarily younger people, just people that I deal with and I talk with them and I go around and I talk in public and I go on the media and so on. And I go out, people come and talk with me and they ask me, do I think things can change? Do I think we can make a difference? Do I think we could save this place? And so on and so forth. That kind of question, yeah? And the answer to the question is absolutely yes. The next skeptical question they will ask you is, well, how do you expect these people, and they're referring to the parliamentarians and the, and the leaders of the country, the rulers of the country, how do you Policy expect because, these yeah. people to vote for a change that's going to take money out of their pocket or, or, or reduce their powers? Mm -hmm. And I say to those people, and I am very sharp with them, I'm not gentle with them, I'm really very sharp with them, I say to them, just a minute, look at where you're standing up. So for the woman, Mala, you're a woman, you're a professional woman, you're an accomplished professional woman. The chambers, the various chambers in the world that voted to give women the vote, just to make one example of one point. There were no women in those chambers, were there? It's men who sat down and voted to give women the vote. So basically, the people campaigning for women's rights had to make the point irrefutably to the powers that be, all of whom are men, that you have to vote for this because this is the change we need. Same thing with our rights as people of color, African and East Indian. The same um, thing with our rights to vote, our freedom of expression. And the point I'm making mm -hmm. is that regardless of the fact that the powers that be enjoy the current arrangements, that is the reason why we need to be very focused and pointed in our advocacy on this issue.
because they can change. They must change and they will change, but they're not going to do so by accident. No, no foreign government is going to ask them to. I'm going to get to the foreign government point just now. We need to insist on it, and we need to we need to actually call on our colleagues. Transparency Institute of Trinidad and Tobago kept a conference and launched the CPI on Thursday, the 23rd at Arthur Lockjack. I attended, and uh, my former colleague and my and my erstwhile friend, my former friend Winston Riley, he is the head of the private sector civil society group. Winston spoke. And made the point that it's about 40 years we're making this point on government to government arrangements. We need these changes now. It was a good conference. But I want to say here, and I want to say it directly, and, and, and I'm thank you for the platform. Transparency Institute needs to do more. It needs to be pointed. They need to be coming on TV, they need to be coming on the radio, they need to be making their voices heard every week. You have a whole institute. Do your work. The reason we are in this problem now. Is for four years, the GCC issued one public statement on public procurement, and that's a letter to the editor two weeks ago. These are facts. If I'm wrong, show me where you made the statement. If we didn't do our work, it's why we are in this position where the politician can say, with no evidence, that they're going to change this and take out that and change the other. And people are so now speaking up in a panic. After four years of silence, we need to we need to recalculate our bearings and get to work, colleagues. Because if we do not, this moment will be lost. This so is a right. very serious moment in national affairs. So help me understand here: sure. where exactly do we stand with the legislation? Yes, I'll tell you. And yes, sure, I'll tell because you. the last budget, the Minister of Finance said it would yes. be proclaimed. Yes, the, yes, I'll tell you yes. where we are. Right. Basically, okay. the, the the procurement. Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Act, which is what the, the Act is called. I'm just going to call it the Act from here on. Yes. The Act will, had some slight amendments, and it's all been passed. So Parliament okay. has finished voting on the Act. Okay. For an Act to go from being passed to being put into operation, it needs to, parts of it need to be proclaimed. And the okay. parts of it that concern setting up the Procurement Office those parts have been proclaimed. That is called the Office of Procurement Regulation. And that is under the leadership of the Chairman Munila Lalchan, who's our colleague. Right. Right. And those parts have been passed. What we are waiting for is to have the Office of Procurement Regulation in a state when the rest of the act could be proclaimed and the whole new system switches on. And I want to say to you, I've checked very carefully with the regulator, directly with the Office of Procurement Regulation, and all of the arrangements are in place, except that we are now hearing, and it's now becoming clear to us, that the current administration, which and the, and the point person on this is Minister Imbert, who's the Minister of Finance, the current administration has a deep disquiet on the question of the extent to which the law controls government-to-government -government arrangements and public-private partnerships. And that is something we need to look at with utmost vigilance because those are the hugest projects that are taking place in the country. So the hugest projects. If, if, you, so, if, you, if you create a system with diluted controls over government-to-government -government and public-private partnerships, you, in fact, have, have actually turned the clock back. We this need is to what put this under modern thinking. control. So then, for example, speak to me about the Petrotrin situation and the way that that was handled. And if this act was properly, fully proclaimed and everything was in place, could this Petrotrin transaction have happened? Could it have happened the way that it did? Where? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me talk about because that. I, I, I have, I have, I the have all these issues in my head. About, yeah. The Petrotrin issue has layers. First of yeah, all, of I'm, I'm not an oil and gas expert, so I'm not going to be able to give any essay on the price of this and the value of that. I, I can't. But I can talk about it from a procurement and a governance perspective. So the first, yeah. the first blame of the thing is the decision to close down a large state enterprise. And I yeah. don't believe, my, my reading of the procurement law, my involvement with it, and so I don't believe that the law as it stands or it was ever intended to control the state, which is the, which is the sole shareholder in closing down or opening companies. So that's the first point. Okay. I okay. don't believe that the law, even if it went into place exactly how we intended, could control a minister of finance who decides to close this or open a company over there. So that's the first right. point. 
the, the, the point that follows from the closure of Petrogen, which is in fact the disposal of assets right. That's part. Or, mm -hmm. or a sequence of new arrangements, some of which right. are refining arrangements and transportation arrangements and different sorts of arrangements. Right. So that, that secondary sequence, to my mind, definitely falls under the procurement or if the law was in place. It ought right. to have fallen within there, yes? And, and because the fact that things. it was given to an entity where the, 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 the press release around that new entity taking up control yes. said that we would be paid the state would be paid x amount up front the word up front was used and then the press release went on to say that oh by the way we're not getting any money up front it would there's a moratorium and it will be 10 years and, and you know yes yes tell me yeah. about how that would have how the procurement um system it, it should it have been properly and fully proclaimed well, and yeah, well, operational that's, how that's would that that. there are yeah. two there are two ways it could have proceeded mm -hmm. as i said i'm not an oil and gas expert i'm just discussing it in, in terms of systems and processes the first right. way it could have proceeded it could have proceeded that the government was in some kind of an arrangement or a public private partnership between the state and that entity established by owtu the one called yeah yeah, yeah. And, and that arrangement, that public-private partnership would have manifested in the financial concession you mentioned. So a headline figure of X is agreed after a competitive process and assessment and so on, okay? Mm -hmm. A headline pr price of X is agreed. Mm -hmm. And terms of how X is paid, which as you would know, time is money. Those are nominal importance. Terms are then agreed and all of that that I've just described in those three or four sentences, all of that would come under a procurement regulator because you're actually dealing with a disposal of public property. Right. Yes? So that, that, that is the kind of... And But that, that, is, of, that is absent it. now because it's... It's absent. Happened. It's not there now because the regulator is not working. It only, it's only right. been in place to put everything, all of the arrangements in place. So they've hired all the staff, they have all the databases, they have everything in place except... The regulations have been agreed. And that is where Minister Imbert has been saying, he said it in a press conference on the 16th of January, he said it very plainly that, in fact, the government intends to have Section 7 of the Act changed to reduce the controls on government-to-government -government and public-private partnerships. And this is why I say it's a moment for utmost vigilance. It's on the Office of the Prime Minister Facebook page, okay? And the minister speaks for about 17 or 18 minutes on this question. And that's, that's mm -hmm. a matter of tremendous importance. What are your thoughts around why they're going to amend it, how they're going to amend it? In other words, to, to, to reduce the restrictions on the government, on G2G and, and PPPs. Right. The reason they're going to do it is because those are the biggest fish. Just to, just mm -hmm. to cut right to the point. Those are the biggest yeah. fish. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it, it's a little bit like... It's a little bit like a like like a family, husband and wife having problems, and the husband is playing around, and the wife and the husband go for counselling, and after all the counselling is over, the husband agrees that he's been outlining too much, and he will pay more attention to the family, and they're having a kind of final session with the counsellor, and he says, but I will need to be out two nights a week, and the wife is like, what nights are those? And he says, Friday and Saturday night. So it's like it's like perfectly preposterous. It can't be that you're meaning to fix up the family situation. And on a Friday night and on a Saturday night, you're not home. Your wife home alone. You have you have to pay proper attention to what you have to pay proper attention to. That's where the, the high biggest, stakes are. That's where the, the biggest high projects stakes. are government to government. And I could I could name a few, but let's just before we get into the name any projects, let's talk about it philosophically. Because we need to understand what we know and when did we know it. To get to the crime programs, what did you know and when did you know it? We know that government to government arrangements are not necessarily beneficial for the country. In fact, they're tremendously, they've had tremendously adverse impacts on our country. There's no transfer of technology. There's been none. I see Mr. Minister but in today's paper talking about transfer of technology. I say without fear of contradiction, there has been none. And that is from research commission. Let me let me let me make the point. There's one report that was commissioned on all this. 
by a PNM administration as it happens, Prime Minister George Chambers commissioned the then head of the public service, a gentleman, a late gentleman called Lennox Bala, the Bala report of March of 82. That's how long we know this. 38 years we know this. And the Bala report identifies all of the shortcomings, so it drains foreign exchange from the country. There's no transfer of technology. There's, a, there's an implicit bargaining disadvantage because it's a bigger country to a smaller country. There's no tendering, so there's no competitive process. They just give you a price and you say you're going to do that. Okay. And so on and so forth. Okay, so from a, so let's just understand, so, however, why would our government, why would anybody want to restrict, sorry, want to not restrict the government from engaging in these types of arrangements with other governments without the due transparency around it? Um, is it that it gives those officials the opportunity, greater opportunity to exercise to do things independently without you know, the re restrictions around the legislation yes. and therefore to make deals that might be more beneficial for the short term, more beneficial to them personally. That's where my head is. What are your thoughts there? Well, you see, Mala, that is correct. The, the point is that there's a flexibility to make deals that are unwise. Right. If we go back to that John Perkins book that I, I, I touched on very lightly in the opening about the, 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 the diary of an economic hitman. And I've John interviewed Perkins that author, actually. You the, did? The okay. Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Confessions. Yes. Confessions, now. right. Yeah, I need to dig you up think, that you that book, you. <laughs> yeah. that book describes yeah. all of these all sorts these of mega bank, projects. Yeah, World Bank that projects. That and, small yeah, companies develop World Bank for. projects. Mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and the countries get licked up economically yeah. and financially because you, you end up having to pay back these loans for projects yeah. that you didn't need. Just to give one example, yeah. that Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, what we call right. Mount Hope, yeah. that was built by a French company, Soditeg, as part of a government-to-government -government arrangement back in the day. Mm -hmm. Over half of the buildings in there have never been used. Over half what of I'm... the buildings, I want you all to listen to what I'm saying, over half of the buildings in Mount Hope, no patient, no doctor, no nurse, nothing ever happened in those buildings. And we paid for them. Okay, what so, about the, the children's hospital in, well, in the cane field? You're going to get me warm. Because the children's, <laughs> hospital is actually, the children's hospital is actually something that we didn't need. We have a children's hospital at Mount Hope. Yeah. But there's a lot of constituency we games. We have enough so children to fill a children's hospital, sick children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of the day, the, the criticisms that are rooted in the Bala report were preceded by a report my, my erstwhile colleague Winston Riley did on the 15th of October, 79, where in fact he presented the Deloitte Best Conference, that's 40 years ago, presented the Deloitte Best Institute's conference on the government to government dangers. Now, the point I'm making is that we have known about this and these detrimental arrangements, according to how you measure it, 37 years or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I am saying also, the problems were identified and analyzed. And what we are hearing now, sad to say, I am not hearing Minister Imbert say, listen, five problems were identified in the Bala report. And we, have, we are going to deal with this one. And we're going to, he hasn't explained how we're going to deal with them. Those problems have not been dealt with. And successive administrations have become seduced by government to government arrangements, whether it was the Dr. Eric Williams administration, we talked about that one. Mr. Chambers followed him and they put the report in place. Then there was Robinson. He had a very limited amount of, of scope for that. But then we were followed in rapid succession. We had Seven Trent and we had the, um, Mr. Pandey was there. We had a whole lot of arrangements that went on, Mr. Patrick Manning and so on. Um, Mrs. Kamla Pasad, Mr. Sir, you mentioned the Children's Hospital and so on. There's a whole stream of these things flowing through the country. What are the benefits? And I want to say something, Marani. I am a transparency and information advocate. Mm -hmm. And I have never seen a government to government arrangement. Mr. Bala saw them, no doubt, because he was head of the public service and he was able to analyze. But I have never seen them. Where are they? These, these, are, these are situations in which our land is being used, our treasury is undertaking a commitment to borrow money to do mm -hmm. a large scale project on our land, supposedly for our benefit, and all the terms and conditions are secret. And as far as I'm concerned, that is just plain wrong. It's unconstitutional. I agree. So we need to get a different generation of information. 
Right. What is the solution in terms of you're, you're talking about, you know, this has been going on and we've identified these problems 40 plus years ago. Yes. 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 Yet we, here we are. We are still here. So yes. what is the solution? The solution, of course, is people like you and that 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 legislation that you have yes. put together. That is yes, one way colleague. the yes. citizens, right, that have have come together, a coalition of the willing, if you will, and and done something by putting this this legislation together, which of course still hasn't been fully proclaimed. But what else? I mean, to me, institutional weakness is at the core of all of this. What are your thoughts? Is that do you feel the same way? And what do we do about it? How do we fix this, Afra? How? What is the solution? Well, what I want to say, um, Mala, in relation to this question, mm -hmm. is that we have come a very long way. Mm -hmm. okay? We created a law where there wasn't one before. Mm -hmm. I want, I want, as I, as I go along this answer to you, this reply to you, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with some of the points that have been emerging. From the political directorate in, in the shape of minister but so for instance i don't want this points, to sound like we are talking him alone you know <laughs> well he's an in instance i'm not I'm, I agree, I'm not in any person you know people will try to discredit the discussion we're having and the and the conclusions we arrive at sure, because they sure. will take it as a, an attack simply on him but all kinds but, of reasons yeah, yeah yes exactly but the point i'm making mm -hmm. is that we are going along a road here mm -hmm. where we are trying to get improvement. Of course. We are going along a road where we wrote a law mm -hmm. to fix one of the huge problems in the country. That law is part of a modern system of public financial management, which is, right. which is, which is a central part of having an effective and a healthy democracy. Right. And uh, one of the things Minister Imbert has been saying, and there's a way that Afro-pessimism has to be fought at every level. One of the things Minister saying, but has been saying, he said it several times, is that in fact, if we if we proceed with this law as it's, as it's currently written, mm -hmm. foreign governments would not want to do business with us because our law is our law is in conflict and it's not a good law and so on and so on. And I want to say, having been I've been in meetings with the European Union, with the IADB, with the American Chamber of Commerce. Lots and lots of meetings, detailed meetings. Those were meetings that were on TV. We were meetings discussing the details of it. And at every point, they express admiration for where we had come to, for how we had tackled this problem and that problem. At mm -hmm. no point did anybody say, well, if you come with this, you know, we wouldn't be able to do these contracts. That mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. emerged. Even mm -hmm. now, even so now, how when is he arriving the, at so well, how is it? Now, even mm -hmm. now on the 26th of January 2020, I'm yet to hear a statement from the European mm -hmm. Union mm -hmm. or the IDB, you hear me, or the CDB, mm -hmm. or anybody really, that, that, that many say, but the cycle, they, that in fact there's an objection to the ideas, problem. And they're uphold, there to uphold transparency as well, yeah. right? So I'm not, I'm not aware that that's a real difficulty. The other thing is that, which, is, which alarmed me to be frank, Mm -hmm. And my colleagues spoke out about it at the transparency event on the 23rd of January, which alarmed mm -hmm. me tremendously, was in mm -hmm. fact the notion that in, an, in, a, in, a, in a case where our procurement laws come into conflict with the other countries' procurement laws, in other words, the government to government, yes, mm -hmm. but the other countries' laws will prevail. Now, I find that... It should be the be, stronger of the two, no? Should it not be? I find it to be really offensive that a parliament, let's, let's yeah. talk about what it means philosophically. I find it really You're offensive. You're surrendering? I mean. Especially somebody, especially somebody of the intellectual pedigree, gravamen, and private danger of but I find it astonishing and unacceptable. I'm not going to just lay down in astonishing. I find it unacceptable that this particular yeah. minister should be saying comfortably in the media that he is putting forward proposals, our parliament in Trinidad and Tobago, that if ever there's a problem, we're going to roll over and they will tickle our belly. I don't like it. 50 years after 1970, this is where we came to, you're going to roll over and I would, you would tickle my belly. No, we didn't fight for this for this. No, no, we didn't do all these sleepless nights 
and put this yeah. first, it's a first That's class piece of law we have there. In fact, exactly, it comes to a point of who is who and what is what. What are you there for? Which is the whole thing about the economic hitmen and the whole question about neocolonialism and the true meaning of independence. That it really is a very serious thing. Afra, what does it I'm mean? Sorry, I, I really sorry, but I don't know if I will take it so far as neocolonialism. Neo neocolonialism. Why could this not just be selfish, personal self-interest? Why could it not because, just be that? I'll tell you why. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, what we, are, what we are looking at is a test of our arrangements and our conscience. If it was one man in a room with his fountain pen signing something that you and I didn't think he should sign, mm -hmm. then it's individual interest. Mm -hmm. But okay. when it's a parliament that was elected in a republic that I'm fairly sure if Minister Imbert puts, I understand the cabinet approved it, by the way. I, I am told that the cabinet approved it Thursday gone, which is which was the 23rd. Mm -hmm. I'm told so. So then now I have to proceed to Parliament, which is next, next two weeks. That's the mm -hmm. timetable he gave us on, mm -hmm. on the 16th of January. If we are discussing a parliament approving that change, then it goes beyond an individual question. Okay, it becomes a question of a, a, a sort of a, a benchmark, like a barometer of what, where our national conscience or our aspirations exist. That, that's my response to you. All right. And so it is the blame is, is leveled on all the policymakers. Lawmakers, the lawmakers, because well, effectively okay, the lawmakers they have to in, vote for this. And, and, I am, and it's just I am a simple make, majority they need, not a special majority. Yes, a simple majority, yeah. I am trying to make this issue as plain as I can. So nobody can say, I it didn't understand know. it meant this, and I didn't understand it meant that. Let me, let me highlight What is the opposition few... saying? What is the opposition saying about this? And do they know? Well, have Dr. you spoken Tiwari, to that? Dr. Tiwari, who in fact had an interesting relationship with us when we were, when we were, um, when he was Minister of Planning. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tiwari actually wrote in one of his newspaper columns, I think about two weeks ago, calling mm -hmm. for the law to be implemented as is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in fact, he, he was standing on this occasion on the correct side of things. And I have to say, when we were, when we were trying to get this law passed into, 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 into effect, mm -hmm. Tiwari's position overall was a supportive one. Although he was, although he was playing around with Invaders Bay, but that's a human, that's part of the human thing. Maybe that's the individual thing you're talking about. You know, where sometimes somebody will be this way and they're that way, okay? Uh, apart from Dr. Tiwari, I can't think of anybody else in the opposition who is speaking. I mean, the opposition is, is, is a kind of a, an odd situation because, for example, I can't, I can't rightly tell you who is the opposition, opposition spokesperson on the economy. I can't True. rightly tell you who is their shadow AG? I don't think they have one, although they have senior counsel up and down the place. Okay, mm -hmm. so there, there's a kind of a there's a kind of a of an odd opposition at the moment, and we have to Absentee sort of fill the gaps. opposition, maybe even. We have to fill the gaps. The, uh, the, so the government, the government arrangements, just for the benefit of viewers, mm -hmm. would include the Mount Hope Hospital, the Twin Towers, the financial complex downtown, the Hall of Justice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the Coover Children's Hospital and things like that. The Labre Napa. Yes, Napa and Sapa. The Labre mm -hmm. Dockyard, which Dr. Mm -hmm. Rowley announced about two years ago to be done in conjunction with the Chinese. That was another another government to government type arrangement. Okay. And mm -hmm. the other thing we need to discuss, um, and the Chinese, before I get off government to government, the Chinese thing that was scrapped the large scale housing project for five thousand new homes with um, China Gizbu Group company, G CGGC with HDC. That was also a government to government arrangement within that scenario because they had tax benefits springing from a government to government arrangement. The public-private partnerships are also huge, okay, in terms, of, in terms of what it is, how it is we organize things. You mentioned Tetratrin, which is one of the, one of the interesting things we discussed earlier. And the mm -hmm. Tetratrin matter would certainly fall as part of a public-private partnership or a disposal of public property. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then there's of course our hotels, the Trinidad Hilton yeah. and the yeah. Magdalena Grand, Hyatt mm -hmm. Hotel. Those are public private partnerships. So it's large scale mm -hmm. things involving hundreds of millions of dollars. And we simply cannot accept an arrangement where we take those things out from the spotlight. Because as I always say, sunlight is the best disinfectant. We cannot conduct these things in shadows and in the darkness because eventually we will get to find out how much money we have lost, which is what was driving Chambers when he appointed Bala in 82, 81, 82. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we've, we've touched on all kinds of things. And hmm. of course, you and I have had this, this, this type of discussion before in a previous webinar, and we've had lots of people uh, send questions and comments. Um, but two of the questions that stood yes. out to me that I would like us to discuss again on this one is yep. in the first place, what can you say to young people in Trinidad and Tobago who feel defeated, who feel disillusioned by all of this and by the corrupt public and private um, untouchables in society? What do you yep. say to them in terms of how do we leave them with some hope and what can be done? Well, the first thing I would do is I would bounce back to my earlier remark about hopelessness. Because change is not only necessary, but it's possible. And in fact, if we're discussing change through legislation or change through culture, which are two sides of the same kind of coin, we're not discussing a revolutionary change, a bomb and a gun and you kill people no. and things. We're discussing a change through a Shift, cultural shift mm -hmm. or a shift in the law. In both of those cases, it's a question of changing minds. Yes. So this is what the work is about. We actually have to put perfectly clear examples out there. We have to represent our work. As, as, as I would say to younger people, I've said it to them before, um, you need to associate. You can't do this work on your own. You need to associate, whether it's your form of club, an association, you, you make you make it a point of advocacy with some group if you're involved in a professional association, but you need to associate, you can't do it on your own. There's a tremendous amount of power that comes from collaboration and association. I agree. Mm -hmm. Our efforts with respect to procurement, which is what a large part of the program has been concerned with, our efforts and, and the success of our efforts was based on those two things working together. On the one hand, we had collaboration. So we had the JCC, we had the Chamber of Commerce, we had the Manufacturers Association, we had the American Chamber of Commerce, we had the Federation of Independent Trade Unions and NGOs, we had the Energy Chamber. We had a broad range of associations, all the way from the left, which is the OWTU and Triton, all the way to the right, the and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce. And the mm -hmm. second thing we had, so the first thing was collaboration. And the mm -hmm. second thing we had, with public education. We never conducted our, right. our math behind closed doors. If we came to a new position, we put it out there to be criticized right. or to be changed or whatever. Agreed. So I think there's everything to play for. We've come to the point where we're 99% of the way there. And this is the reason if you go back to that old, I'm gonna go really old for, for young people, not old Sparrow, Calypso, Lion and Donkey. You almost look it up on YouTube. Down to the I end will. of the song. Let me take a note. Down to the end of the song. <laughs> When the lion is getting bad licks, he just had to fight wild, which is how I see me the same. But now talking about the foreign governments would do this and they would do that. They never did. And they're not saying anything about that now. So it, it's really a very sad moment. You're fighting wild, which is telling me that we have a lot of things on our side. We need to focus, we need to rededicate ourselves, associate with other like-minded people, and let us push on and finish this piece of work. Let us get it done. How could we make a difference before this 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 particular these particular amendments are made? Is there any way that it can be, you know, it can be stymied at this point? Well, I wish I could say things about where we should ask the opposition to. I don't think so. I think we need to brief independent senators. I think we need to make a media blitz of it. I'm using a very royal we. Because as I said earlier, the other colleagues have maintained a very, a very low profile presence. We need to step it up, colleagues. 
you need to be you need to be on TV two three times a week on this question. You're not going to yeah. get it done quietly, and it's not going to happen behind closed doors. That's not how we got this far. We got this far by making a very public, very pointed campaign to, to, to edify the public on what was at stake. And what is at stake is very, very important. We need to have a situation where our resources are used to best effect for the future of the country. And more importantly, it's not just a question of, of, of an accounting transaction in when I talk about resources being used to best effect. More importantly, it's a question that citizens must know and they must feel that they have a participation, they have yeah. a right, it's an independent oversight. Their stuff is yeah, not being yeah. And that is very important in today's world. We cannot be living in a world of information and you can pick up your cell phone and see anything you want to see. But the things in your own country you can't find out. Mm. That nonsense has to stop. So you can pick up your cell phone and see anything except what's happening from Ante Because yeah. you know why that's a secret. It's confidential. It's commercial. That's why are wrong. you asking a question? So we need to we need to bring all of that together and keep campaigning. We have we are ninety nine percent of the way there. Let us push and get this done. So Afra, of course, um, if there's anything I can do to help that effort, uh, you know, do let me know and I support you all the way. I I agree Thank with you. you that this these kinds of amendments that give other countries um, so much power over what happens in our domestic territories is just yeah. wrong. Of Whether course. you call it neo colonialism or whatever yeah. label you call it, you yeah. ascribe to it, it, it really doesn't matter. It's just wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. Uh, Afra, I, I, it's about an hour that we've been at it. And it's been I, like 10 minutes. I know we can <laughs> probably do this all day. Um, yeah. I can't thank you enough. Uh, and Thanks, your Mara. point about education and collaboration. I, yes. If I leave our audience with anything, it's about the importance yes. of those two things. So, um, hopefully, this video will go a long way towards thank you. educating. And I cannot thank you enough for the time that you've spent to help to educate me. And of course, by extension, those who view this video. And the collaboration between us will continue. And the collaboration Great. between us and yeah. ourselves and also like-minded people yes. um, to try to do what's better for our country and to try to make a positive difference. Um, I consider you a comrade in that regard. Absolutely. And I thank you and I support you. And you know, have a have a great weekend for the rest of, of you. your Sunday. And 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 please continue to do what you do for our country. Thanks, I really Mala. appreciate it. Thank you. Have thank a good you. day. Thank you. You Bye -bye. too. Take care. Bye.